Well, hello and welcome to the New York Foreign Press Center and welcome to the journalists who are joining us virtually. Our distinguished briefer today is Isabel Coleman, who serves as the Deputy Administrator of the United States Agency for International Development. My name is Doris Robinson and I am the briefing moderator. As a reminder, this briefing is on the record. We will post a transcript later today on our website at fpc.state.gov. After uh, Deputy Administrator Coleman's opening remarks, I will return and open the floor for questions. And with that, it's a pleasure to turn it over to Deputy Administrator. Thank you, Doris. Thank you for those joining in person and those virtually. It's a pleasure to be back in New York, back at USUN, where I served as one of the U.S. ambassadors under the Obama administration. Here for UNGA, focused on a whole range of different issues, um, including a kickoff yesterday on uh, the SDGs. I was in the General Assembly and um, uh, listened to the many statements urging uh, the world to double down on uh, meeting the SDGs is no no surprise here. Uh, we are lagging in meeting the the um, the goals of the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. <clears throat> We're at a little beyond a midway point, and we have not made nearly the progress that we uh, should make. Uh, USAID is very committed to the full range of SDGs, and much of our work is focused around. Uh, meeting the SDGs and helping our our partner countries uh, work towards uh, progress uh, for the SDGs. I've had a couple of very packed days here, uh, working on everything from food security to an anti-corruption event to a democracy event, and uh, really spanning the the globe from uh, a meeting with um, leaders from Pacific Islands earlier today, um, African leaders, um, European <laughs> leaders, uh, really uh, so many different parts of the world. Um, but we know that the challenges are enormous um, here at the UN. Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about what needs to happen in the world. I can tell you that uh, President Biden is the only member of the uh, permanent members of the Security Council who is here today, and that is really a commitment and a statement of the commitment by the United States to the UN, to uh, addressing the Sustainable Development Goals and, and deepening our alliances, our partnerships around the world, and uh, deepening our commitment uh, to those countries uh, that are most in need, uh, facing uh, the impacts of uh, the lingering impacts of the COVID pandemic, um, the supply chain disruptions that have happened, uh, the food security um, challenges that have stemmed not only from the pandemic, but also from Russia's further invasion of Ukraine and the disruptions to the global food supply from that. Um, and of course, climate change. And the effects of all of this really fall most heavily on the most vulnerable countries. That's why I am very pleased to announce today that USAID is making a $247 million additional commitment to humanitarian assistance for 10 sub-Saharan African countries. Many of them are among the most vulnerable, the poorest in the world, and it is uh, uh, just another indication of how much uh, we believe in uh, really channeling our resources to those most in need, to working with partner countries around the world uh, to invest in um, both resiliency and, uh, and to meeting the urgent needs of the moment from a humanitarian perspective uh, for those uh, that are most vulnerable. So with that, I'll wrap up my opening comments, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Wonderful. And please wait until I call on you to ask your question. And when I call on you, please state your name and media outlet. And to the journalist online, you can raise your hand, your virtual hand, to ask your question. So let's start in the room. Let's start here with yeah. Happy <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, Arif Yaqubi from Afghanistan International. Uh, so the United States is one of the largest humanitarian uh, supporters of Afghan people, uh, but there are news and concerns that a 
Taliban uh, get uh, some of the aids that uh, has been sent to Afghanistan by uh, US, uh, US aid and other organizations. So I would like to ask you uh, what is your explanation on that? And uh, my second part of the question is that how the Taliban have intervened in the uh, uh, structure of uh, uh, sending uh, aids to locals uh, across the country. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, yes, to underscore what you just said, the United States is the largest, single largest uh, donor to Afghanistan and remains so. Um, and, and we are deeply committed to the Afghan people. The concerns that you are raising about um, how we are delivering aid in Afghanistan, uh, we go to extraordinary lengths to ensure that the aid that we are providing goes directly to the Afghan people. We do not provide assistance to the, uh, to the Taliban. And uh, we work closely with our partners to ensure that uh, the, uh, the support that we're providing is going to the intended beneficiaries. We have had some challenges on that. Uh, we've had some aid interference uh, by uh, members of the Taliban, but uh, in those instances, we have explained how we operate and that our delivery of aid has to be directly to beneficiaries. And if we've not been able to achieve that, we have paused our aid in those particular cases. So we did run into a problem in, in Gore province, for example. We suspended our aid, um, but we have been able to work through with local authorities to ensure that the aid is now going to directly to beneficiaries, and we have been able to restart our aid. But um, the, the issue that you raise on aid interference, I think, is one that we have to remain vigilant and uh, and really explain and explain again that our aid is intended to benefit the Afghan people and only the Afghan people in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Ukraine. Oh, thank you. Dmitry Anovshin, the Ukrainian television correspondent. Ma'am, um, you mentioned the food security and, you know, Every, every Ukrainian, everyone from my audience is concerned about the future of the uh, Black Sea grain deal. A couple of days ago, Jake Sullivan told, and I will quote, that we don't see an immediate pathway back to this, but we will continue to press on them, means pressing on Russia. But even if there is no immediate pathway, maybe it's just a roadmap. So could you just describe some steps which might be the part of this roadmap for, for, for returning to, to the grain deal. Thank you, Dimitri, um, for, for that question. Um, you are uh, raising what is truly one of the great um, challenges of our time right now, which is that Russia has invaded Ukraine and really disrupted the grain exports from one of the world's most important bread baskets, Ukraine. And uh, prior to the war, 97% of grain exports, agricultural bulk exports from Ukraine exited the country through the Black Sea. And by Russia um, leaving the Black Sea Grain Initiative and effectively halting exports uh, from the Black Sea and moreover continuing to attack and destroy critical export, agricultural export infrastructure all along the Black Sea. This is nothing less than weaponizing food, and that is what Russia is doing. Now, unfortunately, I do share um, our national security advisor's perspective that there's no clear path back, but um, we do uh, encourage the countries of the world that are uh, quite dependent on uh, food, from Ukraine uh, to continue to push for re, um, reopening of the Black Sea Grain Initiative or, or uh, reinstitutionalizing of that and, and push Russia to go back into the deal. Um, and we applaud the UN's efforts to lead on this issue. I know that it has been a topic for the Secretary General. Um, we know that Turkey has played a helpful role. So is there a 
an actual roadmap that I can uh, lay out for you uh, of a step-by-step -step of how this will work? No. Uh, a number of concessions have been offered along the way to the Russians, which they have rejected. And uh, I think it's really beholden on the, the big food ex importers in the world, uh, and that includes China, that includes many countries in Africa, to continue to, uh, and to push on Russia to, to go back into the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Let's <coughs> go here. <clears throat> Manik Mesa, uh, I hope you remember me. Yes, I do. Uh, nice to see you. You wrote that excellent book some years ago when you were at the CFR. And I'll connect that with a question raised earlier about Afghanistan. But I would focus on the plight of women over there. Uh, how do you see that? And secondly, China has just appointed an ambassador to Kabul. Uh, it's, a, it's not just a de facto recognition, but a de jure recognition of the Taliban regime. Thirdly, which is again related to, to the two questions, India has produced, is ge generating a lot of crop known as millet. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And they are in a position to supply the world. They say that it's, it's a solution to the food insecurity. Uh, would, would that be a viable proposition? Well, thank you for your questions. Um, I will start with Afghanistan and your question about uh, women and girls in Afghanistan. And it is, I would say, one of the most unfortunate elements of the Taliban has been the reprehensible edicts that they've put in place, uh, really prohibiting girls to attend school beyond primary school. So this is an issue that um, we at USAID feel very strongly about. Um, we know that Afghanistan will not be a stable and prosperous country if it does uh, not invest in its full population and does not realize the potential of its full population, including women and girls. It, it is, there's no amount of aid and assistance that will be able to compensate for policies that really set the country backwards. Um, by prohibiting girls and uh, to to achieve their full potential by by going to school. So we will continue to do what we can to educate women and girls, both inside Afghanistan, Afghan women and girls, inside the country and outside the country. Um, but uh, we do call upon the Taliban to to reverse these really um, self-defeating edicts that they have imposed, which, um, when you look at polling, are quite unpopular in many parts of the country itself. Um, in terms of uh, the food security, China's oh, China as well. You know, I can't uh, uh, speak for for China's uh, foreign policy, but I can tell you that from a um, a values perspective, it it uh, it is it is not a step that uh, we would be taking or that we will be taking anytime soon. Um, with respect to, uh, to, to be uh, engaging in that way. Uh, with respect to food security, I think there are many different elements of improving food security around the world. Um, millet from India could be one of them. We, are, we, are, we USAID, we are um, investing heavily in increasing agricultural productivity in Africa, which has the fastest growing population in the world and the most arable land that is um, not being used uh, currently for food production. So increasing the productivity of land that is being used and, um, and really helping African um, uh, agribusinesses, smallholder farmers who produce the majority of food in Africa to increase their ability to produce more. Uh, so I think there are many different elements that uh, will help uh, improve food security over time. But Again, the biggest blow to global food security right now has been Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. Thank you for that. Let's take our next question online. Let's go to Pearl Matibe. Pearl, please unmute yourself and introduce yourself to our briefer. Um, thank you so much for taking my question um, today. 
uh, and I appreciate your um, availability. Um, so I'd like to take you back in time a little bit and hopefully you would agree with me that we do learn from history. You, you, In your opening remarks, you alluded to US leadership and that's what I'd like to um, address my question to you today. So um, Ambassador, back in 2019, Malawi, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe suffered significantly from cyclones Idai and Kenneth, and calls for humanitarian assistance fell far short of the need. So today, the victims of their families live with long-term loss and trauma. What is your assessment of what's different today in U.S. leadership in the last four years? What does U.S. leadership uh, why does U.S. leadership matter today differently um, in your view, Ambassador? I, I, I'd appreciate if you could, you know, help our audiences understand this aspect. And not that I'm suggesting that USAID should in the future sort of go out of business, but I'm sure that millions, in fact, billions of Africans would like to be self-resistant and self-sustaining so how far away are we from USAID helping Africans so that we won't need USAID anymore? How long away are we from this, from that trajectory? Uh, if you can allude to that, I'd appreciate it. But US leadership uh, at the top first, thanks. Thank you, Pearl, for this, uh, for this question. Uh, what I can tell you is that President Biden has prioritized re-energizing our relationships on the continent of Africa. He has hosted um, several now African leader summits, and um, we have at USAID, um, in addition, uh, really increased our uh, support and funding um, for a whole myriad of different investments on the continent of Africa. Uh, Pearl, I would see, I'd like to see nothing more than USAID to go out of business, uh, to no longer be needed in the world. Um, but we are a far way away from that. Uh, we have seen uh, so many natural disasters and calamities uh, around the world. Just in the last couple of weeks, the earthquake in Morocco, um, the awful situation uh, with the floods in, in Libya, and the amount of loss of life and destruction of property. Um, you're referring to um, the awful um, cyclones that affected, as you said, uh, Malawi and Mozambique and Zimbabwe. And, and I was just in Malawi. And yes, the effects of that are still being felt. And it is, again, uh, uh, a reason why USAID is doubling down on our investments uh, to make people more resilient um, in the face of, of climate change, to provide more early warning systems so people can take uh, prophylactic measures as a storm is bearing down, but also to really uh, invest uh, in the aftermath in more resilient systems and to help people um, build back better, essentially. So in terms of U.S. leadership, I think you can see from President Biden's leadership um, that he's here at UNGA. Again, I, I mentioned at the top, he's the only one of the P5 that made the, you know, made the commitment to be here. He's meeting with uh, many, many different leaders um, across uh, the, the globe um, and including um, uh, many um, African leaders and, and heads of state and I think this is just uh, another um, uh, reminder of the importance that we put on uh, our relationships. And it's not just humanitarian assistance. Uh, USAID, of course, we are the primary um, uh, uh, agency for the U.S. government responsible for humanitarian assistance. But we do so much more. It's really about investing in the people in their health, in their education, uh, in their own agency for them to be able to take the steps to be more independent. It's about improving and expanding our trade relationships. Um, just this morning, I was with a whole group of investors 
um, talking about uh, Prosper Africa, which is our flagship uh, U.S. whole of government approach to increasing trade and investment on the continent of Africa. I met with um, uh, fund managers um, and investors uh, downtown earlier today, and the talk was all about ways that we can help increase investment, increase jobs, increase trade uh, to make Africa m much more um, self-sufficient, as you said. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we have time for two more questions. I will take the first question as a submitted question. It's from Mohammed Mahar from El Masri El Yom newspaper, Egypt. He asks, given the increasing impacts of climate change globally, what are the US government's plans to assist countries like Libya that might that might face similar natural disasters in the future. Are there specific sectors or areas in Libya that the US is focusing its aid on, such as infrastructure, healthcare, education, et cetera, following the hurricane's devastation? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so let me just start narrow with Libya. Um, yesterday, I announced that the US government has um, is providing an additional $10 million uh, for response in Libya, uh, which brings our total to $12 million. Now, we know that the needs are much greater than that, um, but this money, we hope, will uh, really help the Libyan people um, in the immediate aftermath of this uh, calamity that has occurred. Um, the money will go towards um, immediate um, uh, shelter needs, um, water, sanitation, and health needs, um, and, uh, and also some uh, immediate uh, food security needs, too. Um, the rebuilding, of course, will, will require much, much more than that, uh, and uh, it will really um, uh, require um, private sector investment, too. Um, but let me expand a little larger now and talk um, about the, the broader question about climate resiliency in the face of um, uh, a constant uh, stream of as we, we see climate disasters. And it really is about uh, two things that we're doing, of course. One is mitigation. We're really working with countries to much more rapidly uh, turn to uh, clean energy. Uh, and that includes uh, in North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and around the world, uh, and uh, to take the steps to really pull more and more carbon out of the environment. Um, but the uh, other thing is, um, is adaptation, and it's investing in resiliency and early warning systems. Um, it's uh, stress testing infrastructure uh, so that they can, uh, dams and buildings and ports and other things can uh, withstand um, uh, the increased pressures. Um, it's also investing in, um, in food security, as we've talked about. So uh, providing farmers with more resilient um, uh, farming methods, um, drought-resistant seeds. We, USAID, we put hundreds of millions of dollars a year into research on um, uh, the most advanced seeds uh, so that um, farmers can um, have the latest in, in that technology to be able to grow uh, crops that are uh, more pest resistant um, and uh, drought resistant uh, to be able to respond to a, a changing environment around them. So thank you. Thank you. So we have time for one final question. Let's see if there's someone who didn't get a chance to ask a question first. So I have, we'll <clears throat> sorry, thank you. I uh, have a follow-up question. So you mentioned that. Name. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Arif Yaqubi from Afghanistan International TV. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, there was a challenge uh, regarding to the uh, U.S. aids for Afghan people. Uh, uh, can you please give us some details, like which kind of challenges, if Taliban intervene, like in, in uh, which way? which part of the country? Was it in a strategic level? Was it in, a, in, in a, some uh, small areas? And my second part of this question, sorry, is that there are 
reports that Taliban didn't allow uh, these aids to go to some certain areas that people like live like Hazaras and other minorities. And, and, and Taliban just navigated these aids all to the areas that they have, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, sympathizers and, and so on and so forth, even their own family members. Uh, and and there are reports that they use some of these aids and money uh, and and abuse women and and tortured you know human rights activists in Afghanistan. Um, as I said earlier, in response to a similar version of this question, we do take um, every precaution that we can to ensure that our aid is going to the people who need it most. The most important way we do that is to ensure that our partners who are on the ground delivering the aid uh, control the uh, targeting of beneficiaries. And if that is not the case, then we have been prepared and we have done um, a pause in our aid delivery. It has, the problems that we have experienced, I would not say have been at a strategic level, they have been more at a local level. Um, and we have worked uh, through our partners uh, to ensure that our aid is being delivered in accordance with humanitarian principle and that it is reaching those most in need. Um, I have acknowledged that we are aware of some incidents of interference in aid delivery. But again, we have halted delivery in those cases and worked through it. And, um, and we continue to make it absolutely clear that our aid cannot be delivered unless it is in accordance with independent targeting and humanitarian principle. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to throw it back to the Deputy Administrator for closing remarks. Well. I would just close by saying again, um, I really appreciate you all coming here. These are important topics that we're talking about, uh, climate change, global food security, global health, humanitarian assistance to some of the most vulnerable countries in the world. These are things that the United States government cares deeply about. It is the agenda of USAID, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here with all of you. Thank you. This concludes today's briefing. Thank you. Thank you.